Good evening. Good evening. You all sound so wonderful saying that. Welcome to Brooklyn Borough Hall. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Ingrid P. Lewis Martin, the Senior Advisor to Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams, who extends his greetings to you this evening. Um, accompanying me is a new member on our team. I'm happy to introduce to you my deputy, Mr. David Johnson. So, all you know, our land use director, Richard Berwick, and his executive assistant, I believe. Um, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Ina Gusenfeld, and I'm the new land use coordinator working directly with Richard at Borough Hall. So I will now turn the mic over to my deputy who will say a few words with you on his behalf. Good evening, all. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my name is David Johnson, as um, Ms. P. Lewis Martin just indicated. I'm happy to be a part of the new Borough Hall staff, Borough Hall team. I'm pretty sure that I will get to know each and every one of you. And I hope that you will bestow the confidence in me that you bestow in Ingrid. Thank you. So um, on tonight's agenda, we have um, a presentation regarding establishing a veterans committee for each community board, which we think is a wonderful idea. Um, presentation by Prosper Park Alliance and a vote on designs for the new entrances on Flatbush Avenue and multi-site recreational amenities at Prospect Park. Presentation regarding a proposed zoning text amendment to limit the sightings of hotels and manufacturing districts to those granted a special permit by the City Planning Commission. Presentation by JustFix.NYC on helping low-income tenants facing wrongful evictions. Presentation by the School Construction Authority on new schools opened and under construction in Brooklyn and a review on SCA's capital improvement projects underway and completed. And last on the agenda is the presentation by the Center for Arts and Education on a current project related to nonpartisan voter engagement and arts education. So um, we do not have quorum at the moment. So we will not move forward with the minutes because we can't vote to approve them. But we can start with our first agenda item. And hopefully by the time we move forward to the second agenda item, we will have quorum. So the first agenda item is the presentation regarding establishing a veterans committee um, for, commu for every community board. I do ask that whenever anyone speaks that he or she speak into the microphone. Please state your name clearly and articulately because it is being recorded. So when we have to transcribe the recording into minutes, we will know who you are, what office you represent, or which community board you represent or agency. And without any further ado, um, I would like to me move forward. Ask representatives of the United War Veterans Council and New York City Department of Veterans Services that are here tonight um, to please come forward. So we're going to welcome, a Brooklyn welcome, Mr. Javier Castro, Ms. Andrew, Angela Coyle, and Ms. Martine Nivosi. So please come to the podium, podium and state your name and titles for the record. So there only seems to be two representatives here, but that's okay. We'll move forward. Good evening, thank you for having us here today. My name is Javi Castro, and I'm here with Angela Coyle. Uh, she is Community Relations at United War Veterans Council. And we want to introduce a wonderful initiative by United War Veterans Council um, to enhance civic engagement and the population of New Yorkers with great potential to improve the local communities, which is our veterans. By the way, if you happen to have one of these in front of you, this is gonna, you can follow along. We would like to encourage the establishment of veteran committees in each of the borough's community boards in order to improve mutual communication and understanding while stimulating neighborhood involvement by these local patriots. Currently, there's only eight community boards in New York City out of 59 that have veteran committees, one in Brooklyn, and if my research is correct, as of June, this is community board number three which happens to be an ad hoc committee. 
we are currently working with two community board, uh, from, one from Staten Island and one from Manhattan in establishing committees. And now we are looking forward to creating this partnership in Brooklyn. The New York City veteran population is over 200,000 and is expected to grow in the coming years. With this expansion come significant opportunities to tap into veterans' teamwork, leadership, and interest in public affairs, as well as the power to advocate for their peers. Our mission at United War Veterans Council is to honor and support veterans and their families through advocacy, services, and sustainability programs. We understand many communities in, this, in the city share this vision and are committed to fostering strong partnership for greater positive impacts. With your help, we can empower our veterans and strength, strengthen their links to establish community stakeholders. We are happy to endorse and encourage all community boards in Brooklyn to consider this wonderful initiative. If you would like to know more about how this can help your community and how can we partner up with you for success, please reach out to us at your earliest convenience. You can contact me at civic at unitedworldveterancouncil.org. So that's civic at uwbc.org. Or Angela Coyle at acoyle at uwbc.org. Thank you in advance for your consideration. Now, mm -hmm. Angela will say a few words real quick. If you're interested in contacting them, Keisha, We'll be happy to provide you with their contact information via email because we do know how to reach them. So we're happy to provide it for you. And we would really appreciate if we can add this document into the minutes. I can also email it to Keisha. Thank you. Javi is amazing to work with. He is very thorough and very committed to this cause. I myself am not a veteran, and that is why I feel so strongly about what I do. I'm community relations for the United War Veterans Council. I am a lifelong Brooklyn Community Board 10 uh, resident, and I started my first company here in Brooklyn, right over on Livingston Street, uh, the Child Abuse Prevention Program in 1984, and received one of my very first grants from Howard Golden. So I have seen change occur in my neighborhood, in my borough. Uh, back in 1984, there were no child abuse laws. There was nothing to help children, very few things. And I've seen and witnessed the change for children over the last century, couple of centuries, and I'd like to see that for our veterans. Um, we need to take care of them. We need to hear them. We need to know what their issues are, not what we think their issues are. There is a lot of, and DVS was supposed to be here, something came up today. That's the newly established Department of Veterans Services with Commissioner Sutton, who is an amazing advocate for the military population. There's over 200,000 in New York. They really need to be heard. And if you need any assistance in establishing a Veterans Committee, that's what we're here to do. Thank you for your time today. So we thank you very much, but before you leave, let's see if anyone has questions. Um, please speak into the mic. Yes, uh, my name is Judith Collins, and I'm a member of Community Board 10, and I just would like to mention um, that we do have, we lie in the uh, Fort Hamilton base area, and also the Veterans Hospital, our board boundaries include that area and uh, I would for about the past 12 years I have been the liaison from community board 10 to the um, veterans and I worked with other members we've uh, we have a booklet a discount booklet for the service members and their families that reside um, on in Fort Hamilton uh, and we participated in different things. I just wanted to bring it out that, you know, that we should be counted in as another community board in Brooklyn that has been doing something. Any questions? Hi, uh, Janice Morgan, Community Board 16. Um, thank you for your presentation um, because it's definitely an issue that I think that um, more people should be um, cognizant of. And so without having a committee, sometimes people tend to um, not pay too much attention to that very special population. But um, my concern is um, how much data is available because um, like Community Board 10 shared, 
They are um, within the Fort Hamilton base. They also have the Veteran Hospital. So um, um, I think it's a natural synergy for um, advocacy around veterans to take place in that community. But I think other communities need to know how much of a population they are dealing with so that they can determine, you know, if it's actually really in their best interest to establish this committee or how they might find another way to really support these causes and without the, the data and knowing where we can, um, you know, very quickly access that type of information, it's hard to tell. Yeah, we would love to partner up with DBS. Actually, we're starting to talk about getting that data. Um, we also can help in identifying veterans in the different communities because uh, we understand um, for committee members, they don't have to be community board members. So these are some ways we can start this kind of conversation in, in providing these resources for you. Also, we produce the Veterans Day Parade. That is how you may know of us. And we have a huge outreach. So if you were establishing a community board, we could highlight that. We could teach them how to reach you. We could help you in absorbing that information. And DVS is currently doing that. But if you think about how many young people are moving, anytime you hear it, they're moving to Brooklyn. They're going to school here. They're starting their families in Brooklyn. So you have them. We can help you find them. We'd work with you. Do we have, yes. Good evening, Guamani Bravo Lopez from Councilmember Stephen Levin's office. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you both for presenting this evening. Uh, as a Marine Corps veteran, I do know that there has been a strong gap between the Veterans Advisory Board and the old Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs. Uh, I do know that the Department of Veterans Services uh, has been doing a better job now in really getting themselves out there. But I do want to thank you for filling in that gap because I feel there can be more outreach to the veteran community uh, at large throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Do we have any other questions or statements? Thanks, praise, accolades, anything? So on behalf of Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams, we thank you for your presentation tonight. And we look forward to working in partnership with community boards as they move forward with you. Thank, thank you. you. We look forward to working with you. <laughs> okay. So we'll skip part two, we'll go to part three, the presentation regarding a proposed zoning text amendment. Um, that will be managed by my trustee, land use director, Richard Derrick. So I'll turn the mic over to Richard. of the Department of City Planning are here tonight to explain their zoning text proposal, further regulating hotels in light manufacturing zones. This initiative is intended to address the proliferation of hotels in M1 districts since 2010 as a means to ensure that sufficient opportunities would remain to support industrial and commercial growth. The text change would require the granting of a special permit based on site-specific review by the City Planning Commission for Hotels to open in light manufacturing districts. This action is part of Mayor de Blasio's 10-point industrial action plan that targets these areas for employment growth and industrial innovation. During and after the presentation, representatives will take questions from borough board members. And so Amanda Ayers has joined us at the podium, and you could state your name again for the record and present. Uh, good evening. My name is Amanda Ayer. I am here with uh, my colleagues Jackie Sunlu and Alex Summer from the Department of City Planning. And we're here to present a uh, proposed zoning text amendment that involves requiring a special permit for new hotels in light manufacturing districts. We have seen a bunch of new hotels open in these areas since 2010, and we understand that they've generated some concern. And uh, the Department of City Planning also has concerns. 
just so you know, the presentation tonight, it's, it's informational. We just released the draft scope of work. So this means that this is not part of ULERP, and ULERP isn't bound to begin for several months still. You will have other opportunities, many more to weigh in, especially as we get closer to ULERP. For now, I wanted to let you know that we are holding a scoping meeting about the draft scope of the environmental work for this proposal, which will be held on October 26th. So this is uh, to inform you what the scoping meeting is about and uh, to invite you to the scoping meeting if you have input at this time already. But we will come back with this proposal um, sometime in 2018 when, ULERP, uh, when we expect ULERP to begin. Also, you may remember first hearing about a hotel special permit in the context of the 10-point industrial action plan. As we were studying the issue, and this was a special permit proposed for the IBZs, the, industri the industrial business zones, uh, we found that there were wider issues with hotels that weren't just related to IBZs, but also um, other M1 districts. And so, um, first it was announced as just part of the IBZs and the 10-point industrial action plan, and we have since widened the scope of this proposal, which is why it has taken us a little longer to come forward with it. Uh, first, I wanted to start, uh, start with a bit of context. As you're probably aware, New York City is growing. Um, there are over 8.5 million people living in New York City now, and the population is expected to continue to grow. We're growing faster than expected. Also, we reached uh, the population projected for 2020 already in 2016. What this means is that there is a growing need for housing. As we all know, there's a housing crisis, and this was emphasized in the mayor's Housing New York plan. But more people doesn't only mean need greater need for housing, but it also means a greater need for services, supermarkets, and other shops, just as examples. And at the same time, New York City's economy is thriving. There are almost 4 million private sector jobs in the city, and practically every year since the recession, so since 2010, there have been an additional 100,000 jobs in the city every year. And there has been growth. Some sectors have seen particularly strong growth, and this is in food services and professional services. This includes law, accounting, architecture, advertising, tech firms. Healthcare has grown a lot, and so has retail. And all of these jobs require office space, they require retail space. There is industrial growth that is also need space in the city. Basically what I'm saying is that all of this unprecedented growth, population, and employment means that there is increased competition for space and for, for land in the city. What we've seen over the last few years is that light manufacturing districts, M1 districts, which I'm going to call from now on the M1 districts, are increasingly becoming areas of opportunity. They represent some of the last areas in the city that are somewhat underbuilt or that are, have parts of undeveloped or underdeveloped land. So with the increasing population and employment, the Department of City Planning needs to ensure that there are sufficient opportunities to support industrial growth, to support in commercial growth, in some instances also residential and institutional growth. And the largest areas of opportunity are those in one districts, but rules and regulations for the land use framework in M1 districts haven't changed since 1961. And some of the rules that uh, are in the zoning framework in M1 districts we think should be revisited, and among these rules are the rules that govern hotel development in the M1 districts. So since 2010, we have actually seen an acceleration of hotels, uh, of new hotel construction in M1 districts, and we're concerned that this is taking away from balanced neighborhood growth. Why have we seen an acceleration of hotel development in, two, in M1 districts? And this is mainly for two reasons. So firstly, there has been a, a large increase in tourism and hotel development in the city, and I wanted to give you a few numbers as a context. So in 2016, there were 61 million visitors to New York City. It's a pretty spectacular number, and this is up from 44 million in 2004. So in a bit more than 10 years, there was a four, almost a 40% increase in the amount of visitors that come to New York City. And so these very robust visitor numbers have also led to a strong demand for hotel rooms, and there has been, much, there has been an increase in hotel development uh, since then. Um, right now, there are about 600 hotels in the city with 116,000 rooms. If we look back seven years ago, there were just 84,000 hotel rooms. So in the last seven years, almost 30,000 hotel rooms have been built. This is quite um, an extraordinary growth. 
and as of June 2017, so a few months ago, there were um, 24,000 more hotel rooms in the pipeline. So there is a lot of hotel that uh, hotel product that is has been recently developed and is still being developed. One thing that is uh, a bit unique about the last this trend, this phenomenon of the last few years, is that the hotel market used to be concentrated in Manhattan, and it now also exists quite significantly, especially in Queens and Brooklyn. Now, Queens is the second largest hotel market in the city, and Brooklyn is the third. Um, so now, if we look at M1 districts, 30% of the hotels and hotel rooms under construction are in M1 districts, and if we look at the existing hotels, it's only 13. So a much larger share of the hotel rooms that are under construction are in the light manufacturing district. The second reason why they're happening in light manufacturing districts specifically is due to uh, the way the zoning works. Um, I, not sure. I hope you can see the graphics. Um, find the screen closest to you that will maybe help you um, understand it a little better. But we modeled out what, um, on the same site, what a warehouse, what an office, and what a hotel looks like. And a hotel, as you can see, can just take advantage, can be a much bigger building, and that is the way the zoning works. So basically, hotels have a competitive advantage um, among many other of the permitted uses in M1 districts. It's not that hotels are the only thing that's allowed. No, many other things are allowed, but hotels have a competitive advantage. Now, what this means is that hotels can use all of the permitted um, floor area ratio, all of the FAR. Hotels can build high, whereas many other uses mainly want ground floor uses, and so available FAR doesn't benefit those uses. Um, hotels work as infill development. They can take, they can site on very quite small lots, whereas many other uses, such as office or industrial uses that are also permitted in one districts, want larger floor plates. There are also height and setback regulations in M1 districts that work for tower development, and towers work very well. It's a building type that works well for hotels, but um, it doesn't work well even for offices who tend to like larger floor plates. And then um, hotels have very low parking and loading requirements in M1 districts, much lower than office uses or many industrial uses. And this, so this is, how, um, this is why the M1 zoning framework is especially attractive to hotels. This slide has a map with the hotels in Brooklyn. Um, it, makes it, it draws a difference between the hotels that are in M1 districts and those that are in other districts. So hotels are allowed in M1 districts, but they're also allowed in many commercial districts and some mixed, in most mixed use, all mixed use districts, I'm sorry. Um, in blue, you can see the hotels that are in commercial and mixed use districts, and in red are the hotels that are in M1 districts. Um, just a few basically data points on the hotel industry in, uh, in Brooklyn. It's that Brooklyn, what we see is that Brooklyn has become its own destination. Um, there are various demand drivers, and some neighborhoods actually draw tourists, but just because tourists want to visit those neighborhoods specifically and are not interested necessarily in other boroughs in the city. Um, there is also uh, the Central Business District in downtown Brooklyn that draws visitors, and then some uh, hotels have more affordable room rates compared to um, similar properties in Manhattan, and so they also draw um, tourists that are seeking those more affordable room rates. As of early 2017, Brooklyn had about 6,000 hotel rooms in 64 hotel properties. and. What's different or special about Brooklyn is that most of the hotels in Brooklyn are relatively small. 75% um, of the hotel properties have less than 100 rooms in, in Brooklyn. And it's, the, so, as I mentioned, it's the third largest uh, inventory in hotel rooms, but it is the fastest growing in relative terms. So seven years ago, Brooklyn had 2,000 rooms. Now it has 6,000 rooms. So it has tripled the amount of hotel rooms in the borough um, just over that very short time period. There are also a few uh, more several full-service upscale hotels in Brooklyn today, and that wasn't really the case um, seven years ago. And finally, and you can see that also on the map, about 40% of the rooms that are in Brooklyn are in M1 districts. So about 60% are in commercial and MX districts, and 40% are in M1 districts. And the three major clusters for hotels in M1 districts specifically are Williamsburg in the IBZ portion, uh, go the, around the Gowanus Canal, there is a pretty large concentration of hotels and also in Sunset Park. There are a few other hotels in M1 districts, but the largest concentration are, are in these three areas.
so the conflicts that, are, uh, that hotel development poses can, are different depending on the site and depending on the area. And for, for our purposes, we have drawn a distinction mainly between two types of M1, of M1 districts. These types don't exist in zoning. They're just as the land uses have played out over the years. Um, we see that on the one hand, there are quite active industrial um, areas. And these are, for the most part, M1 districts that are within IBZs. And in these active industrial areas, there are industrial businesses, and they generate noise and truck traffic and loading, pollution, and many other nuisances that that can conflict with hotels. You know, for instance, uh, street loading and open industrial uses can create hazardous uh, pedestrian conditions and present safety concerns. On the other hand, hotels in these areas uh, invite guests and then the guests can complain about the noise and then suddenly the industrial business can't actually do the activity it was doing before. So that is how these two uses are potentially incompatible in the active industrial districts. Also, as you can see, and maybe from your own experience, hotels in the active industrial districts tend to be physically out of context. They are much taller, and they stand out, and they don't fit in with the neighborhood. Um, there are also M1 districts that are more mixed use in character. This is a citywide initiative, so there are some uh, M1 districts that, are, that have a lot of commercial uses. There are some M1 districts that have automotive uses. Some actually even have some residential uses. So some of them are much more mixed. And in these cases, the hotels often don't necessarily present a direct land use conflict, but we think their development detracts from overall neighborhood character, and it may detract from opportunities uh, to see to direct growth in those neighborhoods more towards residential or business growth, and it can create like hotels can create development that is more oriented towards tourist needs and not the community needs, um, which which we think is an issue. Furthermore, again, the design issue in, in many of these, in all M1 districts, basically, um, the design of the hotels is out of context, and it doesn't contribute to the neighborhood or the pedestrian experience. So for all of these reasons, the Department of City Planning is proposing a zoning text amendment which establishes a City Planning Commission special permit for new hotels. And I'll go into the details of what a special permit is in a second. Um, just to, to be entirely consistent, we're also proposing the special permit for motels, tourist cabins, and botels. Um, but those three uses are much less common or non-existent in New York City, and, and so um, this is, is not really an issue that we're addressing. It's just that we're being trying to be consistent with zoning terms that, that already exist. We think that a case-by-case -case site-specific review process um, for hotels would let everybody consider the appropriateness of a new hotel in the actively industrial areas where hotels and existing uses are potentially incompatible, and also in the more mixed-use areas where the city may want to direct growth towards other employment sectors or additional housing. A uh, city planning commission special permit would also still allow uh, for hotels to serve the needs of the tourism industry when appropriate because a special permit can get granted and a hotel could still take place. Um, generally, we're proposing to apply the special permit to all in one districts and we're not including mixed use districts in that uh, definition. And we're also going to exclude airport properties and areas that are immediately adjacent to the airport. So this affects mainly Queens, but there are some M1 districts that border the airport. And so we wouldn't apply the special permit there because those M1 districts do serve the airport and airport needs. In addition, we will also not require the special permit for hotels that are temporary housing for the homeless. Uh, this is because it is a legal obligation of the city to shelter anyone who needs housing in the five boroughs. And currently, the zoning allows homeless facilities as of right in these areas, and we're not going to change that with this proposal. Um, this slide outlines the application process for the special permit. Uh, a special permit is a discretionary action, and it's subject to full ULIP review, and so as you know, it will go through the community board review, it will go through borough president review, city planning commission review, and then uh, city council if the council decides to uh, bring the project forward. There is also a, a lengthy process, a lengthy pre-application process at the Department of City Planning where we make sure that applications are um, complete and thorough, and that whole process, so the pre-application process together with Healer typically takes about two years. So this is what every future hotel development would have to uh, do in M1 districts in order to get approved. 
Uh, this slide also shows a map of Brooklyn and the areas that would be affected versus those that where hotel development could still occur as of right under the proposal. So many commercial districts allow hotel development as of right and that wouldn't be changed. We're only talking about in one district here. So on the map, the areas that are yellow are the ones that would be affected by the special permit. And then the areas that are in blue are the ones where hotel development could still be as of right. Um, a few things about the environmental review and how we are proposing to analyze the effects of this action. So the current, generally what we're seeing is that there has been a, a hotel development boom over the last few years and we don't think that this will continue because the supply of hotel rooms has been so tremendous. Um, we think the supply has largely caught up with demand. Demand has been growing but it's, it's reaching, it's, it's the rate of growth of demand is slowing and so um, Right now, the pre-construction pipeline actually outpaces our projected demand for 2028. What we're saying is that, or what we have projected is that approximately 28,000 new rooms would be needed by 2028, and the current pipeline has 38,000 new rooms. So we're seeing that there's currently an oversupply and that many rooms in the pipeline, so those are, especially in the pre-app, or like that are in the application process at the DOB that haven't begun construction, are not likely to um, actually complete construction. Um, we're also assuming that many uh, projects that have building permits so that are under construction will vest under this provision and won't be affected by the proposed special permit. And, and so the principal effect of what we're doing is with the hotel special permit, since it is an additional discretionary hurdle, we think there would be less hotel development in M1 districts and more in commercial and mixed use areas. But then again, this all depends on the pipeline and because the pipeline, a lot of the projects now will satisfy demand until the near future. Um, the shift could be relatively modest. So um, overall, we have taken a look at different geographic submarkets. Uh, Brooklyn is divided into three areas, basically, and we think that within each submarket, there can be in some areas a shift from the M1 districts to the C and the MX districts. Um, this would mainly happen in uh, downtown Brooklyn, for example, a submarket takes into account uh, downtown Brooklyn and Gowanus as a submarket, and since Gowanus would no longer uh, have hotel development as of right, we think it could lead to somewhat increased development in downtown Brooklyn. Williamsburg in the mixed-use portion is another area where uh, hotel development could shift a little bit too, and um, the other portions of Brooklyn uh, could see some minor shift, but um, we don't think that that would be very pronounced. So finally here for the timeline, uh, this was first publicly announced as part of the IDZs in 2015, uh, but then we have expanded the proposal, the geographic applicability of this to include all M1 districts, and ever since we have done a study of the hotel and tourism industry, which can also be found on our website and have developed a proposal and written the EAS. And really the next step is the scoping meeting where everybody is invited to comment on uh, the proposal and the draft scope of work. Um, your first question is probably going to be, so when are you actually referring this to the community boards? Um, this will depend on the scope meeting and the comments we get and the extent of the environment, uh, environmental analysis that we have to complete. Um, we are targeting a spring 2018 referral, but that is again subject to uh, the completion, the successful completion of the DEIS. Um, so it, it is, it, we're targeting spring of 2018, but, but that could change. And we will definitely be also be in touch with you ahead of that so that we can schedule the meetings uh, for ULERP. If your individual community boards have concerns or would like an individual presentation before the scoping meeting of this proposal, um, the Brooklyn team is also available to come. Um, Alex has mentioned that some, some community boards may have already been contacted, others not yet, but if you do want a presentation, please reach out to um, the Brooklyn office and we can arrange something. I think that was it. We also have a, well, we have a project page on our, uh, on our website. Um, that you can navigate to under citywide proposals. It explains everything I just said, and it has links to more, to longer documents that explain more thoroughly um, the purpose and need and how we're going to do the environmental review. And there's also um, an email address at uh, m1hotels underscore dl at 
planning.nyc.gov. I also have cards here. Um, if you'd like my contact information, I'm happy to follow up with you another time. I just want to start off with a couple of questions. So one of your slides, you had mentioned that the hotels that are used as shelters would be exempt and therefore remain as of right. So in the context of uh, these uh, temporary housing assistance accommodations for homeless families and individuals, would there be a percentage of hotel rooms that would have to be designated for such public purpose for the hotels to be constructed as of right? And in either case, whether it's 100% of the rooms or some fraction of the room, what happens to the certificate of occupancy when the contract is over and it's not um, renewed and now there's no more shelter accommodation yet you still have the hotel building? So, uh, let's see, you're the first portion. Okay, so um, the way we have conceived this would work and we have worked together with the Department of Homeless Services to, to craft this, or we are working with them better said because we're not entirely, we don't have everything set in stone, but um, the way it would work is that a developer, if they did want to build a use group five hotel for public purpose as of right in an M1 district would have, before getting building permits, would have to reach an agreement with the Department of Homeless Services and, um, and, and get a letter, either sign a contract or get a letter of, uh, in, uh, of agreement with the Department of Homeless Services, which they would then bring to the Department of Buildings in order to get the um, building approved. Um, if any a developer didn't present such a letter or agreement, they couldn't go forward as of right. Um, when the project would be completed, there would be a certificate of occupancy with a notation on the CFO saying that the, this project or this building could be ex used exclusively for um, uh, transient occupancy for homeless, for homeless individuals or families. And uh, so the certificate of occupancy would limit the use uh, to a homeless facility and not a tourist facility. Um, the way we are drafting the language is that the project would have to be entirely, um, there is no portion of hotel that could be tourist use, it would have to be entirely for a uh, public purpose, um, uh, serving, homeless, uh, serving the homeless population. Okay, and then one of the reasons in addition to keeping floor area available. I'm not sure your mic is on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Testing. So one of the reasons besides um, <coughs> properties being industrial and, and therefore want to have less competition for industrial space, to not have hotels in industrial areas, some of the issues that come up with are conflicts between the users of the hotels and loading and unloading and truck traffic with street intersections. So these are similar issues that the residents, temporary residents, which could be a year or more in a shelter environment will have to endure. So would any accommodation be made in terms of walking from the edge of the industrial area through how, however length, that, you know, a few hundred feet or longer crossing streets into the industrial area, would any consideration be given to safeguarding that homeless population residing in a hotel in the M district to try to minimize these conflicts that are a concern for tourists? I think we, we can consider that recommendation. Um, I think also in, in talking with the Department of Homeless Services, there is agreement that housing anybody and on also the homeless in M1 districts isn't, isn't a great solution. Um, it's we have heard that it is needed in order to um, in order to sat satisfy the mandate to house the homeless in New York City. Um, so we 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 will we can take that recommendation and and discuss uh, what what can be done in that regard. So, going to open it up now um, to members of the borough board. If you have any questions or comments you'd like to make on this application. And uh, Amanda is here to uh, respond. Um, I, I guess I have a comment. Um, so, please state your name. Janice Morgan, Community Board 16. So, this, the 
hotels being used as shelters um, has long been an issue. And um, I know around the city, but definitely in the Ocean Hill Brownsville community, which is Community Board 16. And um, one, uh, some time ago, we made a recommendation and um, drafted a resolution um, stating that we would like to see uh, these hotels uh, have a different um, code, I guess, at the buildings department if they plan to be used as a shelter. Because, um, you know, with everything that you said, um, there's still no protection against these pop-up shelters. You know, I understand that there is a homeless crisis in the city, but, um, you know, allowing these hotels to be built and, they, and, and these hotel um, operators being able to um, house the homeless sort of as of right, the city almost incentivizes homelessness in, the, in, in these communities because um, as opposed to building a hotel that um, can be used as a homeless shelter, that same land can be built, can be used to build permanent housing. And so, you know, why, why are we dancing around the real issue here? Is that we're accommodating tourism and uh, you know industrial um, operations, but failing to solve critical issues in our community like a lack of housing, and that affordability is an issue, and so that's why people are landing in these um, in these transient shelters. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one issue about the M1 district specifically is that you actually can't build housing instead of a homeless mm -hmm. facility um, in, in the M1 district, and that's different in the right. C or the MAX districts that allow mm -hmm. both of those things, but in the M1 districts, um, housing isn't, isn't allowed as of right, um, or even by any special permit, so it's not allowed. Right, but, um, it, but it also will now redirect those same people with, you know, with those types of ideas then they, they go and oversaturate other areas that may not have had um, a lot of hotels with that homeless population. And so now and everyone's gonna flock to that particular area and say, let's build hotels there and house the homeless population. I'm not sure if you're talking about um, the homeless facilities that could be built in M1 districts or if you're talking about um, hotels where, or places where we could see more hotel development because of this that we think will that will be that we think will be tourist hotels mm -hmm. because the other type would still remain as of right um, in the M1 district yeah I mean honestly it's a it's a lot of information yeah um, for one night and there's there's a lot of conversation I think that needs to take place not only here but in the community boards to really break this down so that we understand what it is that you're trying to propose because first you know I understand this was something that came out in 2015 you, and, and it sounds like it was set aside and then you came with this um, this IBZ zone the storage and so um, we really need to know what this is all going to shape up to and how it really impacts our communities and the homeless populations because people who are uh, dead set on um, um, circumventing the system in order to, you know, feed their bottom line. They're very creative and the people who live in the communities get railroaded in the end. And so we don't want to see this come together as a nightmare for our community yeah. and, you know, and other people who don't even live in our community end up being more comfortable than we are. Absolutely, and I understand, or we understand that this is a lot to digest, and that is why we are coming a month before the scoping meeting, and the scoping meeting is many months before ULERP actually will begin. So, right. I mean, this is a lot of information, so, so please take it yeah. back, think about it, mm -hmm. discuss, and uh, have and us at the table if you want us yeah. there. And um, lastly, I will say, you know, in the same manner that you're doing the special permit for these M1 districts, that special permit for if you want to operate a hotel, that needs to take place also. The code should not be the same. People should be able to know that a hotel is about to pop up in their community. It should not be a hotel, um, a building designated as a hotel. You're thinking 
you know, when my family comes in for the family reunion, they can now stay down the street from me, and then you find out, nope, that's not possible because that hotel is now housing homeless people. So we, we, there needs to be a level of transparency. Yeah, so one thing, and we understand that that's an issue of how it currently works, one thing that this would do is in the future, it wouldn't be retroactive, it wouldn't affect the hotels that have already been built, but in the future, if if you would, if you see a new hotel application in an M1 district and it's as of right, it is clear that from the beginning it is a purpose-built facility by uh, the Department of Homeless Shelter and it wouldn't be first a hotel in, in disguise and then become something else. But this would be, if this were approved, this would be in the future. So hotels that exist now are, wouldn't be affected by this rule, but it would create some clarity in, in the future as to what is actually happening and being built. <coughs> just want to get some clarity. So within the M district, say in Brownsville, so if hotels for tourists would no longer be allowed to be built as of right, that instead of that property remaining for industrial use or becoming retail use, that people who know how to figure it out with getting contracts to qualify to get awarded by homeless services a contract for shelter, that they might be more aggressive to secure property within Brownsville because they don't have to compete against tourist hotel operations and therefore are you concerned that you might have get more, hotels. more of those type of hotels right. finding their way in Brownsville exactly. because of removing a level of competition yet still not having enough competition for maybe more job intensive use. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's sort of you know, please speaking to the mic. Where the community is 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 fighting to um, to bring the revitalize the community and bring the community up and bring economic development, this becomes sort of sort of a, a competing energy. And so, um, if these folks with these deep pockets beat us to it, now the community becomes once again unattractive for certain types of economic development activity, because now. There's, you know, it, we have all these different homeless shelters, and so, and, and sometimes, unfortunately, those shelters bring activity that the police department has a whole lot of trouble controlling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any other questions or comments? I have a question. Community board number seven. Please state your name. Dan Daniel Murphy. Um, just first clarity. It's, it, the special permitting would would uh, account for M1 zoned lots or M1 districts or both. Let's say there is. I think those are the same thing. Well, okay, but uh, there, uh, there is might, there, what's the difference between? Might there might, might there be an M1 lot within a uh, a district that's got residential uh, on a block that's got residential uses on it? So it's not necessarily uh, in an industrial zone in an industrial business zone, but it's an industrial lot. So we're, we're lot. basing this on the zoning and not the land use. So if the zoning is M1, but there is a residential land use, it is still M1 zoned and the special permit would apply. If there is perhaps an old warehouse that is a manufacturing use in a residential district, this wouldn't apply because it's in a residential district and not... Um, e even though it's M1 zoned? Well, no, if it's M1 zoned, then it would apply. But if it's I'm talking about the lot and not any district. So you have some houses, for example, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue around 47th Street, even though it's an M1 district and also an IBZ. So even though there's a, a residential use there, that property could not be purchased and then have a hotel go there as of right because it's being treated by the zoning, not by the use that's there. Yes. Just a side note, I continue to be floored by Richard's granular knowledge of, of uh, Brooklyn on a block by block level. <laughs> but but you know what, if, if someone filed a special permit on that block, for example, because there's housing on the block, your board may want to recommend the use might be okay, or you might not. Yeah, and I don't want to get too in the weeds for the purpose of this meeting, but, um, but just say, so the M1 zones are given to a special permit, it is, they have, the, the ULO process has to opt in to granting a, a, a permit. Not That's correct. Okay. So my question is, but as Janice pointed out and Richard pointed out, 
you can circumvent this process by creating a purpose-built, or, or the owner or developer can circumvent this process by getting a purpose-built temporary housing shelter. Um, another side note, I don't know uh, where you got your numbers from about most of the hotels being used for tourism. Uh, a, a lot of the hotels in Sunset Park are being are already being used as back to our temporary homeless shelters, have been. Uh, some of the others are being used uh, for prostitution. And it, you know, and have been for a long time, and have been closed down for for, for nuisance, by nuisance laws. Um, my question is: Does the city is the city approaching this with uh, a set number of these uses per district? That is, they wouldn't allow more than four or five or two or ten per community the district. Special permits once that was enacted. Yes. we haven't proposed it that way, um, but but this is. Again, a proposal, so... Um. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's also because not every community district has the same amount of M1 zoning. Yes. And so, uh, by, by naturally what would occur is there would be more, there would be the opportunity and the infill pressure to build more of these purpose-built houses oh, in okay. certain districts over others. And within those districts themselves, in certain neighborhoods rather than others because there are industrial districts. So it's a really sticky wicket that you're approaching because um, the pressure really is for these that these districts. Uh, the rest of this, the actual special, the actual special permit from I can tell you from uh, the history of resolutions for the community board seven is welcome. Uh, we we would like to have some sort of say in the ULA process. It's been a long time coming. As far as the special the purpose built hotels for a temporary homeless shelter. Uh, it puts community boards, and I think every community board here in Brooklyn has the same idea. We have, every community board has a big heart, but we don't want to be dumped on. Um, and so this leaves an opening for that. Um, so please take that away. Please. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Yume from the mayor's office. I work uh, for Intergovernmental Affairs on Housing and Economic Development. And I just wanted to speak a, a bit to your question and also to your question. So, first of all, our number one priority is to build permanent affordable housing. That's something that we have been working very hard on with the Housing New York Plan. Um, we're looking to build, uh, and we've already built um, tens, of, tens of thousands of units of housing and are committed to building a lot more. And I'm happy to talk to anyone more specifically about that. Um, certainly understand the anxiety around the uh, the proposal with regards to the exclusion of the um, transient um, shelters. I just want to be clear that this doesn't actually, this is not, it is not our goal to change our strategy with regards to building new shelters. Our goal, and this is something that we've said publicly, is to move people out of these hotels that where they are staying right now and the cluster sites as they currently exist. The reason that we put people in those, frankly, is because we don't have enough shelter capacity right now um, to house all of the homeless people who are in New York City. And so it's really a two-pronged strategy. Number one, in the long term, it's to build as much affordable housing as possible so to get people into permanent housing. Um, but in the short term, as DCP said, we have a legal obligation to put people in shelter. So right now, because we don't have enough of that shelter capacity, we have to put them in hotels. Um, our goal is, and, it, and it, isn't, it isn't going to be easy, is to uh, try to create as much uh, safe and healthy and uh, appropriate accommodations for the short term so that we can deal with it both in the short term and the long term. Um, but in terms of the number of shelters that we're looking to site, it's, I think it's like 90 citywide, um, and th that is not something that we, and that will come in, sorry, in conjunction with the closure of certain shelters that have existed that haven't been, you know, up to standard um, and all of that. But this proposal for the hotel special permit isn't meant to be viewed as, um, as a proposal to build shelters in M1 districts. I think the, the, the point that we're um, just trying to make with this, this proposal is uh, we are not seeking to change the zoning today as it currently applies to this kind of transient use. Is that it? Please, Ms. Graham. Nijani Granville, Chair of Community Board 8. 
What I'd like to know is, will this have any effect on the construction of hotels in Community District 8? Because I thought I saw that somewhere on your screen, but I'm not sure. Would you like to see the map? This one? Yeah. Um, so every community, board, community district in Brooklyn has M1 districts. So every single one has some M1 districts where uh, this proposal would apply, this special permit for new hotels. Um, and it, it, it is also proposed that it would apply actually to quite a large portion of Community Board 8. If you have concerns about this. Atlantic Avenue car and the blocks going south. So for example, you have a little bit of the C8 district along Atlantic. Mm -hmm. But like for example, your M1 area with the M Crown study this would require a special permit. Okay. Thank you. And one other thing I wanted to ask. I keep hearing all of this conversation about the mayor and how he wants to build housing for the homeless. What is going on with the warehousing of the apartments in the public housing? When we had Katrina, we were putting people in hotels because for some reason those apartments were not being used. And as far as I know, we still have some that are not being used. So is anybody ever going to do anything with those apartments as far as helping the homeless problem? Perhaps your colleague would like to answer that question since you were speaking about the homeless situation. If you travel through downtown Brooklyn, like a long motor, I think those are Ingersoll, on a night like tonight when it's dark, look up and see how many dark apartments you see. Do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, so we'd like to thank you for your presentation and I'm sure that the community boards will take into advisement um, what you presented this evening and you will hear from them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good news, we have quorum, so I want to thank everyone for making quorum. Um, so we'll go back to the beginning of our program um, agenda. The first thing is that we would want to adopt the minutes from June 4th. <laughs> Why are you laughing, <laughs> Ms. McCray? Okay, so um, everyone should have received copies of the minutes from June 4th, and you had the opportunity to review them. Do we have any questions or concerns or any necessary edits? Okay, so may I have a motion to? Okay, so we have a motion. Please, time out. We have to do it the right way. Your name in the mic. <laughs> Pass it. You'll get one. Thank you. Thank you. So moved, Shirley McRae, Chairperson, Community Board 2. So Shirley McRae, Community Board 2, made a motion to adopt the minutes from the June 4th meeting. Would someone please be kind enough to second that motion? Danny Murphy, uh, New Road 7. Has seconded the motion. Second. Okay, good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Any abstentions? Okay, we have one abstention. Um, the minutes, CB1, the hours from CB1. The, the hours full of CB1 abstained. Um, but, okay, so the minutes from June 4th were adopted. Thank you very much. Um, now we can go back to the second item on the agenda, which is a presentation by the Prosper Park Alliance and a vote on designs for the new entrances on Flatbush Avenue and multi-site recreational amenities at Prospect Park. So tonight's presentation will also have a vote on the design for the new entrances on Flatbush Avenue and the multi-recreational amenities, drinking fountains, barbecues, and running lane pilot at Prospect Park. Representatives of the Prospect Park Alliance are here tonight and will be available to take questions from the bubble board members. Welcome, Justine Helner. Swelt, am I saying your name right? Svetlana Ragalina. Thank you. Um, Jabir Taylor and Matt Olahala. Ojala. Ojala. Okay. So please, so they're at the podium. They'll repeat their names and titles for you. Okay. So we open up the floor and we welcome you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having us this evening. Uh, my name is Matt Ojala, Director of Government and Community Relations for Prospect Park Alliance. And I'm joined by Justine Hauner, Svetlana Ragulina, and Jabari Taylor. 
Uh, we're all with the Prospect Park Alliance, and as many of you probably know, we partner with uh, the city and the Parks Department to care for Prospect Park. Uh, we're happy to be here tonight to present designs on two new projects that we've been working on. Uh, the first being the creation of two new entrances along the Flatbush Avenue perimeter of the park, and the second project being a multi-site recreational amenities uh, project. Um, so the, the first project is funded out of the Parks Without Borders program. Um, many of you will probably remember back in 2015, the Parks Department announced um, this program with the goal of better connecting parks to their surrounding communities. Um, they set aside $50 million for this project and said that $40 million of it would be um, divided up between eight parks throughout the city. Um, there was a large um, community outreach effort to um, get ideas from community members from throughout the city on projects that um, they wanted to see implemented. Um, we were fortunate enough um, that uh, a project that the Alliance had proposed received the most community feedback through this, um, through this community engagement work that the Parks Department did. Um, so this project is $3.2 million, um, and um, it really builds off of um, previous um, efforts um, to really improve the northeast section of Prospect Park. Um, we are about to launch construction on a restoration of the Flatbush Avenue perimeter of the park, uh, and that's thanks to Borough President Adams and Councilmember Lori Cumbo. Uh, who provided uh, generous funding for that project. Um, we're also in design on um, some restoration to, to pass in, in the northeast section of the park, thanks to the mayor. Um, and so, so with these, all these projects combined, it's really an opportunity to, to enliven this section of the park. Um, and then the, the second project, so we're gonna, we're gonna try and be very, as quick as possible, um, we have the second project is multi-site recreational amenities and this is a combination of three small projects that that we turned into one uh, and this includes $175,000 for the installation of freeze resistant drinking fountains and this was a, these will be installed along the park drive this is funded uh, out of Brad Lander's participatory budgeting um, efforts um, the second is $80,000 for community, two new community barbecue sites. And that was funded from council member Matthew Eugene and his participatory budgeting efforts. And then the last of the three is $100,000 for a resilient running lane pilot. Um, and that was funded from council member Steve Levin. So um, I'm gonna hand it off to our crew of architects to, to really dive into the details of these projects. I'm Justine Harler. I'm the Senior Landscape Architect for Prospect Park Alliance. Svetlana and I have been working together on the Parks Without Borders project, so I'll give you the sort of background and introduction, and then she will talk you through the design. Um, this is a view of Prospect Park as it was being built. You'll see Flatbush Avenue is this road running along the bottom, and we just like to show this to show what the park was like when it was very, very young, and also to show this very stately LA of trees that was being built along the sidewalk. Um, as Matt mentioned, this is funded out of the Parks Without Borders project, and you can see this funny map of all of the entrances of the park. All the ones in gray are existing. The two that we're talking about tonight are the ones in orange on Flatbush Avenue. You can see that there's a real blank space in terms of entrances, and as any of you who've been down there know, it's really hard to access the park from that side. You have to go all the way from Grand Army Plaza down to the Willink entrance. Um, the zoo is in there, but that doesn't get you into the park. So these are really needed. They really um, help people access a fairly underutilized portion of the park and give some um, equality to who can get to the park from where. As Matt mentioned, these two entrances are kind of like the um, linchpins that pull together a lot of projects we've been working on over the last few years. Um, the things that you see in the sort of light blue and darker blue are all projects that are happening now in various phases of construction and design. 
The Flatbush Avenue sidewalk restoration that we're starting construction on next month will really improve that, the look of that side of the park and bring it into a more equitable situation with what you see on Prospect Park West or Prospect Park Southwest, the same alley of trees, benches, historic lighting, garbage cans, what you want to see on the face of your park, and a new fence and a wider sidewalk. And then these entrances will tie that into the park. We're creating a welcoming face for the park, and now we're creating the entrances. The uh, other blue projects are a participatory budgeting project. That's the Dongan Path one. We just finished construction on that. And then the Pass in the Northeast, which Matt mentioned, is a mayoral funded project. But that really connects and makes more accessible this whole interior network of pathways. Um, and we're also starting a very long-term look at what we do in this northeast section. So all of these things are creating accessibility and the entrances are really the key. Zooming into a more zoomed in location of the primary entrance, that's the bigger one that will be more of a grand entrance. Um, just to go back, I didn't talk about that. That's We chose this location for a couple of reasons. For one, it gives a good distance between Grand Army Plaza and Willink, where you don't have to go too far to get to it. It also is kind of the prime location because it connects to all these other pathways and because it is topographically related, meaning that the elevation outside the park and the elevation inside the park, even though there's that berm in the middle, the elevations on either side are almost the same, which means we can create an accessible entrance, which was really important in a project all about access. So that was not only the paths coming together, you're connecting to a lot of different sections of the park here, we also can create it a totally accessible entrance. Now some site photos. This is what Flatbush looks like right now. We're look this picture on the top is looking at where the new entrance is. There's not much to see here now, just the berm which is a good shield from the traffic of Flatbush, but also is an impediment to getting into the park. Broken fences, bad paving, all of that will be transformed over the next year with the Flatbush sidewalk restoration. This is standing on top of the berm looking back out to Flatbush, just to give you a sense of where you are. What you see across the way is the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Looking at Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Looking north on the berm, and looking into those paths that we saw connecting in the plan. So you see it really is a kind of confluence where you can go into the woodland, you can go up to the rose garden, you can go straight across to the long meadow here. And then this is looking back at the berm from where all those paths meet. And now I will hand it over to Svetlana Ragulina our assistant landscape architect who is really doing the lead design on this project. Thanks, Justine. Thanks for all your time, too. Um, so here's our proposed design um, at this moment. What you're looking at here is um, the Flatbush Avenue sidewalk on the bottom, and it will open up into a larger paved area, um, like our other entrances on Prospect Park West. And this paved area, which will also be concrete, will um, have benches and a bike rack and lighting and waste bins, all of all of things that are usually in other entrances. Um, we're also going to be working with the, with DOT to create a traffic light at this at this point and a crosswalk in order to slow traffic and bring people to the other side of Flatbush. Um, what we're doing with the berm is we're, we're cutting it, we're cutting through the berm, we're also going to be retaining it with a low retaining wall. That's the gray lines that you see here. And as you enter this break um, in the berm, it will be retained by the same wall that will then periodically open up and um, contain a series of benches. Um, or seat walls. On one side to the right, um, the same wall um, will step up um, and lead visitors up to the top of the berm, which actually has a running trail on it. 
that was very important for us. We wanted to retain that because people use this rustic trail to, to exercise, and we wanted to be able to, you know, have people continue running up and down it. So one side has steps and um, some seat walls that you'll see in the next, next image, which is the view. The other side, alternatively, does not have step seat, uh, steps or, or seats. It just has a scramble, which is just a series of boulders that are laid one on top of another, and it also will offer a sort of rustic, um, rustic running experience for visitors. The material inside of this entrance will be our standard hex paver block material. We'll also add lighting and our standard benches. This is the first view that you're looking at. It's from Flatbush Avenue. Here you see the low walls. They're about three feet tall. And we're proposing to make them out of um, granite block. Granite is used extensively throughout the park. This is a view that's looking at, um, at that series of steps and retaining wall seat walls. People will be, able to, will be able to come here and rest while they're waiting for others or, or use it to go up and down the berm. On the opposite side of the view, you see the scramble. It's just a series of rocks. And this is an, another view from the south. Here you see again that seat wall, uh, our standard light poles, accessible seating and benches. And now a little bit more information about the secondary minor entrance. Also, you may have gathered from the views and from our plans that we've been working pretty closely with the Parks Department arborists to protect as many trees as we can, especially the larger ones on the berm. And that has actually defined our design a little bit, just trying to work around those. Um, the secondary entrance, not only will it be an entrance, we will also complete the work of the Flatbush Avenue sidewalk um, with this going all the way to the zoo. This entrance is another place where pedestrians can access um, with an accessible slope, and it also is just for security for police vehicles or small work trucks, but not for a large truck to come in. It's really more of a minor entrance like you see all around the park that's just a break in the fence. Nothing too fancy. This is the site as it looks now. There actually is a desire line, a sort of informal path going right along that accessible level before it slopes down into the much more uh, steep area next to the zoo. So we're kind of following that where, and tying into our existing network of paths. So it's just a small eight to 10 foot wide paved path, just asphalt, boulders where we need it to retain the slopes, and we're also adding lighting, and that connects into that path project that we're designing now. And this is a view of what it will look like when it's complete. Thank you. Any questions? And this Janice Morgan Community Ward 16, this view that we're looking at, um, this is coming, this is an entrance from Flatbush. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions, comments, anything? Should we vote after each one? Or are, you vote after are, you are you finished with your presentation? Yes. I don't know if we should vote for each project or vote at the end. <laughs> Let's just do everything and then we'll okay. vote. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jabari Taylor. I'm an assistant landscape architect at the Prospect uh, Park Alliance um, and I'll be walking us through our multi-site recreational amenities project that we're in the process of. Uh, we're going to be uh, installing multiple amenities some of which are drinking fountains freeze resistant that will be accessible all year round to our mini runners 
Uh, we're going to be installing two new barbecue areas as well as a portion of uh, porous uh, asphalt running pavement. The porous asphalt running pavement uh, section is going to be a, a pilot project um, and, and this paving sort of captures stormwater on site and allows it to go back into the ground but it also is a softer material um, for runners. It's going to be located uh, close to the 9th Street entrance just in front of the band shell. Um, the product as you can see here in cross section has several inches of broken stone under a two inch layer of porous asphalt. The porous asphalt is 50% asphalt and 50% uh, recycled um, tire or tire rubber. Uh, the next uh, project or next part of the project is five freezer resistant drinking fountains. Uh, three of the drinking fountains are completely new. Drinking fountains don't exist in these areas currently, two of which uh, we're going to be retrofitting existing drinking fountains that aren't uh, freeze resistant such that they'll be freeze resistant. Um, the new bottle fillers and water fountains will be these and then you can see the existing uh, fountains there, the type E with child bowl. Um, so we'll be uh, excavating the plumbing pit uh, underneath and replacing that with a plumbing assembly that will allow it to be freeze proof. The two barbecue areas are going to be on the uh, south uh, east side of the park, uh, park side entrance as well as the Lincoln Road entrance. Um, we're going to be having some concrete pads and um, installing grills on them as well as hot coal bins for uh, hot coal disposal and uh, trash receptacles. These are the furnishings, um, the trash receptacle and then you can see the grills here as well as the hot coal bins. And that's pretty much it for this project. Any questions? Do we have, do we have any questions? None? Comments? Okay, so we can move to vote. <laughs> May I have a motion to approve the designs for the new entrances on Flatbush Avenue and multi-site recreational amenities, drinking fountains, barbecue grills, and running lane pilot at Prosper Park? Pass it on the mic. Wait. Pass the mic. Thank you. Ed Powell, Community Board 14, so moved. Thank you, Ed. May I please have a second? Uh, <clears throat> Judith Collins, representing Community Board 10, votes to approve. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. All those against? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. So that concludes our business related to the designs for the new entrances on Flatbush Avenue and multi-site recreational amenities at Prosper Park. We thank you kindly for joining us. Great idea. I love that park. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So now we can go to item number four, a presentation by JustFix.NYC on helping low-income tenants face, facing wrongfully evictions. Wrongful evictions. Um, we have representatives here who will be able to take questions from the borough board. So we want to welcome Dan Cass. Is Dan here? Hi. Welcome. Cass. Mm -hmm. Welcome. All right. Hi. Can everyone hear me all right? Um, I just want to start by thanking the Borough President's Office, the Office of uh, Constituent Service, for having us tonight. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Um, we're really here just to advertise a new service um, that's available to your neighbors, your fellow community members, um, and to talk a little bit about what we do, um, how we work in Brooklyn and in, in your various community districts. Um, so just to start, my name is Dan Cass. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Just Fix NYC. Um, we're about a two-year-old uh, nonprofit organization. Um, we operate exclusively here in, in New York, um, in a, a, every borough, but uh, our home is in Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn, so very, very uh, happy to be here. Um, I've been working as a tenant advocate for over five years, uh, starting as a tenant myself um, in a long-term legal dispute with my landlord at the time, um, which is what got me 
sort of involved. Um, my background is of, as you might imagine, in technology as well. Um, and so that's kind of where, uh, along with my, my fellow co-founders, who are also all native New Yorkers, um, this sort of took root. Um, our mission is to build digital services for New Yorkers in neglectful housing uh, situations. Our particular focus is on tenants who uh, might be in rent-stabilized units um, uh, or generally have a landlord that they might consider to be harassing them, uh, denying repair work, utilizing construction as a form of harassment. Um, you know, anybody that might, you know, sort of feel like their home is, is being threatened in some way or that their rights are being infringed upon. Um, like I mentioned, we are a nonprofit entity. Um, everything that we do is free, available um, to anyone who uses it. We don't have a business behind this. You're not about to see us like up in Silicon Valley or anything like that. Um, so, you know, we, we are a, a formal 501c3. Um, we work, uh, again, with uh, tenant organizations and legal service organizations all across the city. Um, a big thing um, that we like to call out up front is that we're not here telling you that technology is here to like, save the day um, and, and to alleviate the housing crisis, which you all know is a, is a major issue. Um, we're here to add tactics and, and additional services, additional layer of uh, comprehensive support to the pre-existing efforts that are already happening in your communities. So we work with the local tenant organizations. We partner with them all across the city. Um, uh, you know, again, uh, we have many, many here in Brooklyn. We work with uh, a number of city council persons, uh, the borough president's office to collaborate on cases that they might be getting in their constituent service offices. Um, so this is very much everything you're about to see is, is meant to go in, uh, hand in hand with the current types of tenant support that we see um, in our you know, neighborhoods and communities at the moment. Um, so just as a, a quick overview, um, and I'll get into this uh, individually, and, and of course um, we'll leave behind uh, materials so I'm sure you'll have questions. Um, we offer two sort of primary services at the moment. Um, one is a service that tenants directly uh, utilize um, to sort of document and take action around their housing issues. Um, and we also have what we call a, a sort of a dashboard, uh, an advocate dashboard type product. Um, that's used by our tenant organization partners, uh, legal services, and the like, um, and some of the constituent service offices um, for the, your local city council persons also use this. Um, I'll just sort of to take out the elephant in the room, uh, we are obviously acutely aware of the accessibility concerns that might come with something like this. The majority of our users are um, elderly, uh, senior citizens, uh, non-native English speakers and so everything that we do is very much with that in mind um, we know that you know not everyone is as tech savvy as, as the person who's standing in front of you um, and and that's a particular focus of our work um, and I'll get into how that actually happens um, a little bit of a demonstration um, so how this is currently being used out uh, sort of in your communities um, we work, um, so the legal definition or the legal terminology is called a pro se tenant. This is someone who doesn't have legal representation. Um, as some of you who are aware of the current right to counsel uh, legislation that recently passed, um, ensuring uh, legal representation to tenants in eviction cases, so uh, holdover cases or non-payment, um, that actually doesn't necessarily apply to folks who are in these sort of informal situations where uh, they need to sue their landlord for repairs or uh, are not actually having a, an actual court case on the books. Um, there isn't, you know, it's not part of the right to counsel uh, law that they are also going to be insured legal representation. So we, of course, um, are taking a particular focus on that. Um, our services have been uh, um, live for about a year now um, after uh, 18 months of uh, piloting and testing. Um, so we've served uh, about a thousand cases in that time frame. Um, this uh, 16 partners is actually a little out of date. We have now about 30, uh, again, across the city. Um, to give you a perspective of how that is playing out currently here in Brooklyn, um, I'm sure that's like not great uh, contrast or anything like that. But over since uh, in 2017, we've had about 450 cases, um, again, spread all across uh, the, the borough. Um, you know, obviously, the more cases we get are neighborhoods that are currently facing high degrees of displacement, uh, potential rezoning, where, you know, we, you know, 
common uh, knowledge is that harassment is you know sort of on the rise it's certainly something that we see in the distribution of the folks who are utilizing our services um, we uh, distribute primarily through our community partner organizations um, in various neighborhoods and we also are also pioneering uh, digital marketing so we operate kind of like a, as a technology startup would um, we advertise on places like Google and Facebook um, and one of the reasons why we've established these services to begin with is that there's a real lack of, of solid information or very accessible information to tenants. Um, and we know very much that the people are, are obviously looking for these things online. They're searching Google for, you know, what are my rights as a tenant? Um, and there wasn't really anything that was tailored to uh, addressing them in a really easy to understand and, and easy to read way. Um, so that's one of the things that we really focus on and, and where we pick up a lot of our, our users. Um, the general process, again, for a tenant, um, you know, again, we operate on a spectrum of if you are completely on your own through this process, you'll have something to do. But we try, um, you know, the core focus of this work, again, is integrating with the local tenant organizations um, and, and anyone who is there to help you in your situation. And so, um, you know, once you sort of start a case, um, you know, the, the, the classic sort of adage or, you know, information that you'll get up front is document, document, document. It's exactly what our services are built around. It's about getting together that paper trail for you to have to document these instances of harassment. If, uh, you know, the repair issues that might be, uh, you know, not changing over time or, you know, in fact, getting worse. Um, it's really about storing that, what we would think of as evidence. Um, and that's going to be useful to you in a number of different uh, ways in which you yourself can choose. Um, so if you're going through a legal case, if you want to send this to your local city council person, for example, we kind of leave that open for you to decide. And, and of course, we try to guide you on an easy to use pathway. Um, we have two different major ways, um, and I'll get to that as to how we provide actual direct assistance, um, you know, in terms of connecting you to an advocate or uh, we provide some advocacy services ourselves. Um, and of course, actually getting some real results um, for you in your housing situation. Um, so really basically, and again, um, what we're here for is just to make you aware of this and something that you can refer to um, folks in your, in your communities. Um, if you're a tenant, we, again, we try to make this really easy. Um, this is, I should clarify, a website um, that you're going to. It's not an app that you have to download to your phone. That's a really big distinction. So you don't need to have a smartphone to be able to use this. Anything that you have that might be connected to the internet, you can use it from a library at a public, uh, at a pub, uh, computer at a public library. Um, you know, whatever sort of device you might have, this is going to work. Um, all you have to do is simply go to justfix.nyc, get started. Um, again, it's, uh, it's going to work on whatever device you might have. Um, I'll get to how, you know, if you don't have a, a, an, a smartphone or inter internet device, you can actually still have access to these services. Um, again, we're a nonprofit, so this is completely free. Your information is very secure and confidential. We don't sell this information. We don't share this information um, to anyone who, you know, might want it. Um, and it's currently available in both English and Spanish, um, and we're looking to add, you know, of course, more languages um, as we, you know, have the capacity to do so. Um, so you'll start by going through, um, and I'm, I'll go quickly through these slides. I know you're all probably pretty tired from a long day. Um, you'll start by doing an actual room-to-room -room checklist um, inspection. If whoever here is, might be familiar with tenant advocacy work, we just digitized a paper copy that had, you know, 100 little check boxes on it. We make that really simple and easy to go do. You go do a, a room by room, um, selecting all the types of issues that you might be experiencing. Um, and we give you the opportunity to add custom things, things that we might not have covered, um, as well as the indicators of uh, common harassment on the part of a, of a bad landlord. Um, once you do that, um, we'll ask you for the bare minimum of, of information. All we're really asking for is your name, your address, and your phone number. Um, what's important about this is that you don't need to have an email address to be able to use this services. Again, we know that folks might not, not reliably know what their email address is or remember their password or whatever. All you really need is a phone number um, to be able to create an account. Um, your address, um, once you enter that in, we have access to data um, from 311, from HPD, 
um, from the Department of Buildings and DHCR. Um, and so we're gonna cross-reference the things that you're reporting with what we might already know about your building and your landlord. Um, if there might be other tenants in your building that have also reported issues, we're gonna you know, use that to contextualize what we might recommend to you. Um, and so some of those steps um, that, we'll, that we'll sort of guide you through, um, you know, namely just gathering evidence. So when you upload photos, if you have a smartphone, um, your smartphone is capturing the time and date and location of when that photo was taken. Normally, this is a really creepy thing I think that our phones are doing. Um, but in here, it actually can, down the road, if you go to a legal case, be actually used as evidence to state objectively uh, the, these photos and that becomes really really important for folks who again who are unrepresented and trying to just tell their story um, with a click of a button you can actually request your rental history from DHCR this is crucial for rent stabilized tenants um, to be able to know the actual history of their building and if there was per uh, perhaps an illegal destabilization or deregulation um, we also pro uh, provide a legal template to send a formal letter of complaint to your landlord um, in many ways, this is a precursor um, to be able to go to housing court to sue them for repairs. They want to see that you've, you've you know, made an actual complaint to the landlord. Again, these are things that we try to, you know, the metaphor here that we like to use is TurboTax. You click a button, the letter gets sent, you get the tracking number. You don't have to do, uh, you know, there's not a lot of uh, bureaucratic hurdles that you have to jump through. Um, and we also, you know, of course, provide better entry points to 311 to getting an HPD inspection we're integrating with the court system. Um, so next year, you'll actually be able to um, create the documents that you need for various court, uh, housing court actions directly through our service. Uh, the thing I like to tell folks is you'll be able to sue your landlord uh, with your phone. People seem to like that. Um, you know, again, uh, folks really utilize this service to becoming an, and almost updating uh, their log on a daily basis. They're uploading photos, um, documentation, and then really this is building out uh, case it's giving them more leverage to state their story more effectively and that's really what it's all about um, we provide them the opportunity to schedule um, uh, virtual appointments so it's on a phone call via email or, or even text messaging um, with a team of trained expert volunteers as well as uh, law school students we partnered with some of the law schools around the city so you can actually get connected with someone who can give you some basic information They'll, you give them access to your case so they can already kind of know what your situation is before you talk to them. Um, and we've also built the single largest uh, directory of tenant support services um, across the city. We have over 300 resources. Um, and so once you put in your address, we'll be able to pinpoint the exact community groups, uh, local representatives, legal services that not only are going to be, you know, you're gonna be eligible for, but are gonna make the most sense for where you are. We, you know, give you easy subway directions and the like to get to them. Um, so, you know, what all this builds towards, um, you've been using this to take various actions. Everything you do is, of course, logged very securely. Um, and you can now share this really easily. Um, so with uh, email um, or text message, uh, your case can be shared to, uh, say you meet uh, your local constituent service office or you meet with a tenant organizer you can text your case right to them. They are now able to you know, stay up to date with your situation. Um, but again, for most folks, they are on their own throughout this process. Um, and if they log in, um, they can log in. There are public access computers in house and court that they'll, are, they are able to log into. Um, and of course, there's nothing better than a good piece of paper, right? Um, so they can print out this entire case, um, everything they've done through the site as a document, um, bring it into house and court, Again, we work with the state um, access to justice uh, representatives um, and have had the opportunity to present this to uh, a large number of housing court staff, the judges um, who you know, are aware of how this service works. Um, and so therefore, you know, you're not just bringing in a, a you know, they're like, what is this thing that you're showing me? Um, which felt like that was an important step. Um, so again, you know, for, your, for tenants um, who are dealing with these things, it's about documentation, it's about getting things together, getting them organized, and we'll help you walk you through some of the, the, the you know, kind of the, the best steps to take um, in your situation to give you a strong legal case if you need it. 
Um, so secondly, um, we have what is an advocate dashboard. This might be less relevant um, for the purposes of this meeting, um, but this is essentially how tenant organizers and, and um, various folks who are working with large numbers of tenants can actually keep track of the people that they're working with and, and the cases that they're building. Um, so simply, um, you know, tenants can link their accounts to a dashboard to an advocate. Um, the advocate has an easy way to, you know, stay on top of everything. Um, you'll be able to refresh the page of tenants uploading a photo. You'll see the new photo, essentially. Um, it's particularly useful for folks that do home visits, um, that, you know, are, you know, trying to keep track of a lot of folks at once. Like I mentioned, um, you actually have the capacity, if you're an advocate on this dashboard, to create accounts on behalf of people as well. So a tenant doesn't necessarily need to, if you know, they are uncomfortable using the technology, they don't have a smartphone, you as an advocate can actually create an account for them and manage it. So if you're doing a home visit, you go in, you take a bunch of photos, it's, it's logged as if the tenant had done it themselves. Um, and finally, you know, we make it easy to just sort of send referrals so folks can, you know, if they have lists of tenants, um, their phone numbers, they can easily send and the, the tenant will get a text message inviting them to sign up for the services. So we, you know, trying to make the outreach and distribution um, as seamless as possible. Um, and so finally, you know, I'd love to, you know, happy to answer any questions. Um, again, our only agenda here is that this is a new service um, that is available to anyone who might need it or want it. Um, it's very simple. We have um, some outreach materials that I'll leave by, but all folks need to do is go to justfix.nyc. Um, we're happy to collaborate, um, as we do with the borough president's office, on uh, particular with particular tenant associations and buildings, individual tenants, um, as well as you know, uh, you know, identifying if you have particular landlords that you think have patterns of bad uh, bad behavior across their portfolio. We actually are building up the tools to help, uh, you know, understand and track those patterns as well. Um, and yeah, my email, our email address is just hello at justfix.nyc. You can get all this information on our website. Um, so again, thank you so much for, uh, for the opportunity. Thank you. Do we, have, do we have any questions? Comments, please state your name. Nijani Granville Community Board 8. We recently started a committee to deal with tenant issues. Our residents and our board members were telling me that all we were dealing with were LPC issues and the tenants were feeling neglected. There was a lack of information about rights and what have you. So I think this is right on time. And I'm hoping that you would be able to come out to the committee to actually do a presentation because this is the type of thing that we need right now. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, concerns? So, Mr. Kaz. Oh. Sorry. Danny Murphy, Community Board 7. Uh, do you have this, does this translate into Spanish and, and uh, Chinese? Um, English and Spanish at the moment. Um, okay. And we're working on, on um, like a simplified Mandarin version as well. Okay. Please state your name. Alicott, Council Member Menchaca's office. Actually, Dan, our uh, community, uh, one of our community constituent workers, Lane, she gives this power, this uh, training in Chinese. She's done it with our, uh, some of the people in our office. She had a table of about five or six people and she gave them the run through of how it works. Thank you. That's, that's news to us. <laughs> but thanks, good to hear. Okay, do we have any other questions, comments? Well, we want to thank you. It's an awesome, awesome um, presentation. And I hope that all of the community boards take advantage of it. Excellent. Um, I just realized we really didn't do roll call. So Keisha, would you do the honors, please? Thank you. Councilmember Barron. Councilmember Cornyhee. Councilmember Cumbo. Councilmember Deutsch. Councilmember Espinal. Councilmember Eugene. 
Council Member Gentilly. Council Member Greenfield. Present. Council Member Lander. Council Member Levin. Here. Council Member Mizell. Council Member Mealy. Council Member Menchaca. Here. Council Member Reynoso. Council Member Traeger. Council Member Williams. Community Board 1. Community Board 2. Here. Community Board 3. Here. Community Board 4. Here. Community Board 5. Here. Community Board 6. Community Board 7. Present. Community Board 8. Present. Community Board 9. Community Board 10. Present. Community Board 11. Community Board 12. Community Board 13. Community Board 14. Here. Community Board 15. Here. Community Board 16. Here. Community Board 17. Here. Community Board 18. Thank you. Okay, so tonight's fifth agenda item is a presentation by the New York City School Construction Authority on new schools opened and under construction in Brooklyn and the review of SCA's capital improvement projects underway and completed. So we have representatives of the School Construction Authority who are here. They'll be available to take questions. We welcome Fred Malley and Tamar Smith. Welcome, thank you for coming. So when you get a chance, state your name at the podium for the record, please. Thank you. Presentation. Hello, I'm Fred Malley, uh, Director of External Affairs for the New York City School Construction Authority, and I'm joined by my colleague Tamara Smith, who has more technological knowledge than I do, <laughs> who is a manager of external affairs for the School Construction Authority. We welcome you. We just opened this September. <laughs> at 21 Hinkley Place. It's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, here. Yeah, here. PS, PSIS 338 just opened off of Coney Island Avenue and Hinkley Place. 21 Hinkley Place is the address. Councilman Eugene's office um, was there for not only the uh, the groundbreaking, but for the ribbon cutting uh, ceremony on the opening. And this is in uh, School District 22 and Community Board 12. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Tamar. Hi, um, as Fred said, I'm Tamar Smith from the School Construction Authority. I'm the Community Relations Manager from North Brooklyn. Uh, so we'll be trading off during this presentation. Um, what we'll be looking at is the SEA's capital plan. Um, the School Construction Authority builds schools uh, and does major renovations on schools throughout New York City. Um, our current uh, capital budget after the February amendment is $15.52 billion. Um, the amendment, which happens generally once or twice a year, uh, adds funding to the budget. So in February, there was an additional $600 million added to the capital budget. Um, and the budget is divided into these three categories. Our capital uh, investment, which are major renovations to buildings. Um, I always say when you see scaffolding around the building, that's us. Um, capacity projects, $5.9 billion. And what we call mandated programs, which are programs that we are uh, mandated to do by the state or the federal government. Um, for example, replacing outdated boilers with more efficient ones, replacing lighting systems with safer lights. So that's what that's dedicated to. Um, so this, of course, is spread across five boroughs, 32 uh, community school districts plus District 78, the high schools, and District 75 schools for special education students. Now, what Fred and I would like to do is go over our capacity program in the districts that have seat need. So we'll do that one by one. I'll take the North Brooklyn uh, districts and just explain what you see up here. I know it's small, so I apologize. And we can send this um, 
this uh, presentation to anyone who would like. So what we have here first is District 13. The seat need were funded right now for 2,593. I should mention, of course, we're right in the middle of our current capital plan, which runs from 2015 to 2019. So right now we have amendments each year, but in a couple of years, we'll be gearing up for the next capital plan. So right now, this is what we have funded. Um, and what we do is talk about funded seats and we acknowledge unfunded need as well. Um, so here for District 13, funded seats right now, 2,593. Now, we have three school sites that have been cited. That means we found a spot for them and um, we are ready to go on building the school. And we have two So the Dock Street Middle School um, for STEAM Studies opened in Dumbo um, last September. That had 333 middle school seats. Um, we've, just, we've just found the site for a new school in downtown Brooklyn, actually pretty close to here, at Albee Square West, which will also probably be a middle school, 392 seats. And then uh, the Pacific Park Project near the Barclays Center um, is meant to be an IS for 640 kids. And then we have these two other unsighted um, projects. And District 13 has an unfunded seat need of 824 seats. All right, District 14. Two projects that are not cited, both in the Williamsburg Greenpoint subdistricts, that's how we divide up the districts when we look at seat need. Um, one project, 612 seats approximately, and one, a smaller school of 379 for a total of 991 seats. Now these are not cited, although um, there's a possibility that a developer site um, may be chosen in the future. Sometimes our schedule though is dependent on them building their buildings. So, um, and then in the District 14, Subdistrict St. Juan, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, another 572 unfunded seat, seat need. District 15 um, has quite a lot of seat need, funded right now 3,480 seats. And in the past year and a half, we have cited quite a few. Um, the two schools at the top, PS 516 opened last year, and MS 442 was a middle school in um, Carroll Gardens, which has moved to the Bishop Ford Educational Complex. Uh, and four, or no, five are brand new and we're working on right now, and they've been cited in the past year or so. Um, this one here is a, uh, you'll see a picture of it, is a leased parochial school that we will be opening next September. Um, and it'll be for 224 kids. And then, thank you. And then we've cited these additional ones um, in various parts of the district, Sunset Park, Carroll Gardens, Guamas Red Hook, and Park Slope. That's how we divide, those are the sub-districts. Um, and then in District 15, we still have unsighted, but funded, 1,621 seats. So we're, we're looking for sites for those additional seats. And District 15 also has an unfunded seat need, 3,706, so quite a bit. And then pre-Ks, we have quite a few that opened in the past couple of years, and um, we're working on for the future. And then in School District 19, um, as Melinda knows, <laughs> we are uh, starting very soon, probably within the next couple of months, the groundbreaking for a new 1,000-seat school. Um, in District 19 in the Cypress Hills East New York subdistrict. Um, and one note about District 19. There's also really good news about a school called the East New York Family Academy, um, which has been in the old building for quite some time um, and is funded for a brand new building, including a completely renovated pool and a competition sized gym and all kinds of things that they don't have right now um, under something called the class size reduction funding. They have trailers in which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, TCUs, temporary class units. So they'll be taken away and they'll have a brand new building and we're very, very excited about that. It's not, it's not um, 
technically a capacity program because their school will remain a similar size, but they'll get a brand new building. Okay, Fred, take it away. He's in District 19 and on. Okay, District 20 has, uh, School District 20 has the distinction of being now the most overcrowded school district in the city of New York here in Brooklyn. Uh, across the city, but in, in Brooklyn. Uh, the good news is we've just broken ground on a new 976 combination primary and intermediate school in the district. And um, that, that will open up in 2020. And then also we're uh, working on an addition of PS 127 combined that will provide 100 and 308 seats. Uh, but we're, we're currently funded for 4,869 seats. And also, as you can see, we have plenty, seven projects yet to be cited. Oftentimes what happens when you have an overcrowded school district uh, similar to uh, uh, school district 15 in Sunset Park, the difficulty in district 20, school district 20, is finding the sites because real estate is at a premium. Also in district 20, as you see, we have an under, un, unfunded need of another 5,453 seats, pretty much uh, evenly divided amongst the three sub-districts of school district 20. Now we turn to District 20's pre-kindergarten uh, inventory, and you can see we've provided almost 2,000 seats for pre-kindergarten in, in School District 20. Now District 21, we have two additions underway for a total of nine, uh, 912 seats. Uh, that's all the funded seat need in District School District 21. And we also have an underfunded, uh, unfunded seat need of over 1,500 seats divided evenly amongst the uh, sub-districts. Um, when we get to school district, pre, uh, district, school district 21's pre-kindergarten initiative, you see we have over 594 seats built um, in, in District 21 most recently. Uh, a pre-K we completed at 1223 Coney Island Avenue this September. For District 22, uh, we have a new project, which I'm proud to announce right now, uh, that would be an addition at PS 254, uh, the most overcrowded school in District 20, School District 22. That will open up uh, construction, currently in design, uh, for an addition at the Avenue Y uh, campus of PS 254. In addition, we've also, as I said, built uh, the new PSIS uh, 7, excuse me, uh, 338 on Hinckley Place and Coney Island Avenue. And in addition to that, we have an identified but unfunded need for another 844 seats throughout School District 22. School District 22 also has, uh, we've built 540 pre-kindergarten uh, centers uh, throughout the district. And Brooklyn, here's our, here's our, we call them temporary classroom units or TCUs. Sometimes they're called portables, trailers, uh, as Tamar was indicating. We have so far removed 10 uh, TCUs, temporary classroom units from schools throughout Brooklyn. And uh, oftentimes, we're lucky enough to take out the TCU and put in an addition, as occurred at PS 170, 152, uh, 193. So we're moving along under that way. And in addition, we have in the process the removal of TCUs at, at these schools for another 28 temporary classroom units. The funding is there throughout the city's capital budget to remove all of these temporary classroom units and to replace them with permanent additions. The problem is trying to, where do we put the kids in the interim? So the, the population, we need to get those children uh, located somewhere else, which the parents don't want, so that we have time to build the additions. Now we turn to new schools. 
And as previously mentioned, here's another shot, uh, a real shot, not a rendering, of the PSIS 338 21 Hinckley Place uh, for 757 seats. Uh, it's going to grow. So in other words, year by year, the, the grades will increase until eventually it's 757 seats. And here's some pictures on the inside, gymnasium, classroom, and a little shot of the uh, sun-drenched library for easy reading. And here's some new schools in construction in Tamar's area. Well, we'll kind of go back and forth. So here's the parochial school I was mentioning in Sunset Park. Um, we're completely renovating the inside. Um, it closed last year. That's Council District 38, School District 15, Community Board 7. Um, and that'll open next September. And uh, here's one of Fred's. Uh, I can. <laughs> okay, PS 101, the addition on uh, Benson Avenue. That is, as you can see from the picture on the right, currently in construction. We're laying the foundation now. On the left is a new kindergarten classroom. That was built uh, over the summer so that we could make the connect necessary electrical connections. The, old, the previous kindergarten class was knocked out and uh, turned into an electrical room for the, so that Con Ed already made the connections that will power the new additions. All we have to do now is build it. Okay, and here's a rendering of the District 19,000 seat school, uh, Council District 37, School District 19, Community Board 5. Um, and that'll be opened in September 2020. Um, and here also a rendering of the, P the addition to PS 32 on Hoyt Street, um, Council District 39, School District 15, Community Board 6. Um, it will anticipated that we'll be done with that by September 2020 as well. Um, and it'll, uh, hold on, hold on, sorry. it'll expand, <laughs> expand the school by 436 seats. Oh, here's this District 20's uh, new school I mentioned. The ground was just broken uh, on 59th Street, and this is a much needed school because even though it's in District 20, it borders the overcrowded District 15 as well. And the IS component, the intermediate school component, will be a, a state-of-the-art art school that can draw from around Brooklyn. Oh, here's, here's some shots of the playground. As you see in the back of the school, we have a large playground and then a small early childhood uh, playground, which isn't that small, but it's smaller than the general playground. Okay, and then a few schools um, that have opened recently. This is PS 516 on 4th Avenue in Sunset Park. Um, phase 2 added another 113 seats to a phase that had already opened two years earlier um, in September 2016. Um, and then this is the Dock Street Middle School I mentioned earlier for STEAM studies in Dock Street and Dumbo. Um, Council District 33, School District 13, Community Board 2. Um, a 333 seat IS, which opened last September as well. So. New schools in design. Uh, these are the additions we have in, uh, in design in South Brooklyn, PS 97, and um, on Stillwell Avenue, uh, PS 127 on 7th Avenue, and PS 254, which I just mentioned, um, on Avenue Y the most overcrowded school in District 22. And new schools. And so again, these are in design. Um, and uh, the anticipated occupancy, actually, this 2021 is Brooklyn's year. Every single one of these will open in 2021. Three additions and three new schools. The East New York Family Academy I mentioned, which will be a 602 seat school. Um, a newly sited school in Sunset Park on 5th Avenue and 36th Street, anticipated September 2020, 2021, 404 seats. And, um, oh, and a new one, again, just sited in Sunset Park on 8th Avenue and 46th Street, um, 328-seat school, uh, also September 2021. And then we had a few, a sample of our universal pre-Ks, which are uniformly delightful, I must say. 
large and sunny and quite beautiful. This is the pre-K center, the Dock Street campus. Um, close by the middle school is a, a pre-kindergarten with 72 seats and it opened last September. And this one just opened this September, the Sunset Park, oh, Sunset Park, yeah, 25th Street, um, 72 seats as well. And a uh, really nice um, exterior for a new pre-K center, very large one, 324 seats, um, located in District 20 on 62nd Street, Community Board 11, Council District 44. And another pretty, oh, this is the interior. New kitchen, classroom space, multi-purpose area for those kids. And uh, the Coney Island Avenue, which Fred mentioned, which opened up in September, 72 seats, Community Board 14, School District 21, Council District 45. And one in construction on 93rd Street in School District 20, Community Board 10, Council District 43 will be 252 seats. This is a rendering of what it will look like. And this is just last week in construction. It will open next September 2018. As you know, there's been a, the mayor's program of universal pre-kindergarten. Oh. <laughs> the mayor's program of universal pre-kindergarten, up until this point with this school, uh, was all lease buildings, converted uh, buildings into UPKs, as we call them, universal pre-kindergartens. This will be the first ground-up pre-kindergarten building in the city of New York. Now we'll turn to some capital improvement projects. All right, capital improvement projects. So again, this plus mandated project is about two-thirds of the capital budget. And this just gives an idea of the kind of, all of the kinds of programs we do. Um, in total, in Brooklyn alone, this capital plan will be spending $1.2 billion in capital improvement. And what do these projects do? They enhance um, academic spaces. They keep our buildings safe and comfortable and watertight. Um, they keep the, the heat on. They keep the cafeterias looking good. So all of these categories, from athletic fields to playgrounds to auditoriums to uh, infrastructure you never see, but that is so important, is what we spend on capital improvement. Okay. And as I said, it's $1.3 billion in Brooklyn, over 1,000 projects. And here's a sample of the other placement at PS3 in Community Board 3, Council District 36. Um, a new science lab, middle school science labs were a big um, priority in this, in this capital plan. Uh, exterior modification, we do quite a lot of that. Uh, another one, uh, here's George Westinghouse, a library upgrade, really nice one. Exterior modifications, we work on the bricks, uh, flood elimination, roof, parapets, everything that keeps the building safe and watertight. Another one here at PS 102. Community Board 10, PS95, quite a lot of these. And uh, the Bowling Hill School for International Studies, just down the street, exterior modification job. Uh, and that same building also got an upgraded library through this project, through the funding. And then Resolution A, and we all know that this is uh, funding that comes from council members and our presidents. And um, it allows schools to get upgrades on projects that they might not have been able to otherwise because it's not in the capital plan already. So here's a really nice uh, playground redevelopment. I believe this is Council Member Reynoso. Here's a room conversion in a school in Community Board 1, School District 14, a gym upgrade in an intermediate school, a really pretty library upgrade in Council Member Carnegie's district. A uh, brand new kitchen at PS 158. I think this is Council Member Espinal. So it's just a sample of um, the kinds of things we can do. So here's our contact information. I know that we're running out of time. So if we don't get to questions that you might have tonight, we're available anytime. Email, we can send this um, presentation around. But if you have specific questions now, open it up. Yes, Judy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Fred. 
Uh, thank you and Tamara for a very good presentation. Um, I have a concern from the community board chair. Um, in June, she sent in June she sent a letter to um, Ms. Grillo um, with saying that our community board at the May meeting had overwhelmingly uh, voted for that the Angel Guardian site be considered. And we were wondering, is anything happening there? Thank you. Hello? <clears throat> yes, uh, well, first of all, we thank the community board for their continued interest in helping uh, providing sites for us throughout uh, the school district and all the other uh, community boards that are able to help us. The, as the eyes and the ears, you're out there, you know when a building is closing, a store is closing, and it might result in a new site for a school. With the respect to the Angel Guardian Home, a wonderful potential site, an entire city block, uh, we've been in contact with the Sisters of Mercy who own the property, and at first, uh, they did not want to speak to us because uh, Catholic Charities was about to take over. Then what happened is that Catholic Charities was not in a position to take over the entire city block property, so what we did is made an offer to take 50,000 square feet of that property in partnership. You know, we would buy that part, and Catholic Charities would take over the remainder, the larger part, in, in the idea of trying to partner the entire block for, for uh, youthful purposes. Um, so what it is, though, is that at this point, we're in contact with them, their attorney, rather, and um, nothing is really moving because my un our understanding is uh, Catholic Charities is in the, in the process of trying to work out the finances for their part of the deal. So we have, the, as, the, as the budget indicated, we have the money ready to purchase the 50,000 square feet if it's made available to us. So it's an issue of waiting for Catholic Charities to work out there. I was going to be retired about five, six years ago. But what happened is we, we have an increase of 40,000 students each year. It's, it's quite amazing. And um, just as an aside, most of those, it, it seems like they come off the plane at LaGuardia and never leave District 24 in Queens, which was the most overcrowded. But we were so aggressive in building schools in District 24 that now Judy's area of Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst, is now the most overcrowded in beautiful Brooklyn. So they found their way from Queens to Brooklyn, and it's, it's still, we are still staggering to keep up with the increase in the student population. There are so many schools uh, and school, entire school districts overcrowded. So we have a long way to go to catch up, and as indicated by our budget, sometimes the funding's just not there. I, I gotta tip my hat to not only our own Tamar, but Councilman Michaka, uh, 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 Community Board 7, and School District 15 in Sunset Park for actually helping us cite every dollar, every seat that was funded in Sunset Park District 15. I didn't think that was gonna happen. But so we are aggressively pursuing it, trying to, but um, we, we always need more funding. And it, it's, I hate to say this, but the truth is we have the funding. It's finding the sites. So if anybody has a potential school site, you could email us at sites at nycsca.org. And uh, we'll receive that location. All you need is to give us the address and we'll send people out to take a look to see if it's, it's uh, uh, plausible for a school. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks. We're not done yet in CV7, actually, <laughs> which is uh, leads to my question. Uh, by the way, I just want to say uh, thank you for, for saying that. Uh, one of some of the help for SEA was that Community Board 7, before, before I was even there, uh, created a siting committee to actually look for sites within the district to help out SEA in their, in their search. Um, speaking of which, 4302 4th Avenue uh, 
is there any hints at negotiate where you are in negotiations for the for, the, for uh, procuring that building? Yeah, I mean it, the site was um, approved by the, by the city council in June, so that's that's the step that was needed to um, wrap up negotiations. But as you know, these things sometimes take longer than we think. Um, we're not in danger of losing the site; it's absolutely still continuing on. Um, we are, as you know, taking the lot behind it through eminent domain, and those two lots are needed together. So that's a long process. So it's, you know, we'll give you updates anytime anything changes, but that's where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. Shirley McRae, Chair of Community Board 2. Um, I have several questions. The first one is a request, not a question. I'd like to have the same information, if possible, that Community Board 2. 15 asked sure. for, that my colleague asked for. Okay. We also are going through our uh, capital and expense budget. Um, as a matter of fact, we'll be going through it at this month's general meeting, general board meeting. So mm -hmm. if you can get me that information, I would okay. appreciate that, as well as a copy of, your pre of this evening's presentation. Absolutely. OK. Uh, what I can do is email it to Keisha. You have it, probably. Yeah. And then is it? possible for you to send it around? All right. Thank you. So everybody can get it. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, school District 13. You know our woes. I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very much so. Yes, I do. And what we have been doing with all of the construction that's going on in downtown Brooklyn, each time a developer comes before us, we ask them, and I'm sure you're aware of this now, mm -hmm. um, you have any space to put a school in there? <laughs> okay. Everyone is not as amenable as others of, as doing that. Um, speaking of shortcuts, there are people who have tried to incur, you know, tell us that they want to put, they'll give us the space if we do tit for tat. We don't want to do tit for tat. We need the space. We have all of this space, all of these new buildings going up in downtown Brooklyn. And it seems as though, um, and my complaint, and I'm going to tell you what my complaint has been, been and I apologize for it. The school, uh, school construction authority is never on time, but now I see why, with your budget as far as matching it with the development that's going up and the timeline that de development is going up because pretty soon we feel that our district is going to be inundated with students as well, but homegrown <laughs> because of all of the development and we'd like to get a ahead of it as much as we can and we need your help. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, and we agree. Um, mm -hmm. The 420 Albee Square Mall West, uh, Albee Square West, yes. that is an example of a developer who is willing yes. and able to offer space for a middle school. So we are constantly, like you are, um, talking with developers and seeing what they can offer. And like you, uh, there is sometimes a, um, a trade-off, which we don't like to we don't like to do, right? We want to offer every child in a brand new school the same as every other child in a brand new school. Um, and so some spaces simply don't work as much as we're trying, people try to convince us that they will when we say, well, we'll need more. We need more space for this. We need more space for outdoors. We need a larger gym. We, we, we need the amenities that are, that we know the kids need. Um, so we look constantly, and some just don't work. And we're always very happy, for example, with that one, when they do. Um, but yeah, exactly. We, we are, this is, this is kind of the wave of the future in some ways. As lots become um, unavailable, as Fred was saying, and real estate is at a premium, we see a building going up, and we ask the same question. And they come to us. You know, so there's a back and forth constantly. And in District 13, in many ways, that, that will be, I think, more and more what we end up doing. Um, so there are other 
negotiations going on, and you all will be among the first to know when there's anything else that comes up like that, like Abbey Square did, which was really just recently, in the last few weeks. Um, and we're really hoping for some more because we know very well the need there. Um, I know that ECF is also doing some, some projects, but you know we're not part of ECF, but they have their own ways of leveraging their properties, the properties, so we're hoping as everything downtown Brooklyn, it's also uh, District 15, um, right. is able to... ECF has helped a lot. They have. They have, they they have, have helped yeah. a lot. But yeah. We always need Absolutely. more and, and I agree, we, we, we have to get out in front of all of this, and we're trying very hard to do that. You know the saying, if you build it, they will come? Well, uh, along with them yeah. come babies. Yes. <laughs> okay. That is true. That is true. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McRae. Yes, good evening. How are you tomorrow? Good evening. Good to see uh, you. Melinda Perkins, Community Board 5. One, I wanted to ask, you mentioned the TCU removals. Mm -hmm. um, I knew about East New York Family Academy, but the mm -hmm. others that were mentioned in the, in the presentation, 302, mm -hmm. 214, mm -hmm. and I think it was another one, um, 190 possibly. Okay, um, I'll take a look. From District 19. Mm -hmm. Where are the, what's the plan for the students when that removal is taking place? Are you in coordination with DOE on that? Do you have any information? We are. I don't have information on those, but I can get them in the okay. office and find out exactly what we're planning to do. Um, sometimes we, as Fred mentioned, build a, an addition. Sometimes we're able to move the kids back into the main building. You know, the TCUs are quite old at this point and conditions were different. And um, sometimes the DOE space planning folks walk the main building and realize we really don't need to do this anymore. It's not, it's not an adequate place for the kids. We have ways of getting them back into their main buildings, and we can do that. Um, sometimes schools are moved into other buildings or are co-located, and so that's another way. But I can get you information specifically on those schools and what the plan is. The ones men mentioned in the presentation, and also yeah. 202 on Hegeman. Okay. Um, I think it's a elementary and IS. I think it's a K through 8. Um, they had a large TCU kind of population in their yard for some time. I don't know if mm. that was included in that. If you could find Tell me any what school that is. PSIS 202. I think it's Ernest P. Jenkins. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see 302 is here. Um, okay. Yeah, it's not on this list. So what we have is, what we gave you is removed and in the process of removal and the capital plan is a list of ones that have yet to be removed remember we have two more years for this capital plan and so we're hoping to hit them all if we possibly can but you're right the challenge is where do the kids go um, and that takes certainly a lot of working with the DOE to coordinate the plan for that because it can't always be an addition right. you know that's and the not last always an question budget. Um, just to move along quickly mm -hmm. as possible I know it um, <laughs> really late. EDC has an initiative, an anchor tenant. I'm not sure if I'm saying the actual program, but I know it, it deals with um, properties that are in um, possibly industrial zones in different districts. And what they're doing is they're guarant guaranteeing an anchor tenant for developers who want to come in and build. And it's typically a city agency that will come in because it guarantees like 50% of the rent for that particular building. Has DOE been in talks with them or SCA? Because it's potential mm -hmm. sites for schools. That's interesting. I don't know, um, Fred. The problem is we've, we've run into this, um, a similar situation in Sunset Park, uh, school, uh, Community Board 7, district, School District 15, west of 3rd Avenue, say. It's an industrial area. So it's very nice that there can be incentives, although it might not be needed as much there, uh, to bring in corporations, and but the, the, the crux of the matter is would, would residents want to have their children go to a school in, in that area? So that's, that's really a decision we ask the local school uh, community education council. Would they give us something in writing saying, we, we, want, we want you to build a school here in that zone, that in, like say a, 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 a Into a manufacturing zone, if if we were to build a school there, 
So that's kind of the balancer. And, you know, we'd be happy to build if the parents, you know, build it and they will come, certain neighborhoods and manufacturing areas, parents just don't, you know, the trucks, the 18-wheelers, it's, it's a, there are busy areas, so not, not, a, not every location is perfect. I know there's a potential site, and, and this will be it, I promise, um, at uh, East New York Junction, where they're thinking about having some sort of tenant program there, anchor tenant program there with EDC, and it's, it's an interesting area because there's it's not completely industrial mm -hmm. um but it's a great potential site for something like that and i know the community was pushing for an education-based program there um and with the anchor tenant edc may have been looking at hra which really is redundant <coughs> in the community. well thank you um it's it's certainly yeah. east new york junction um it's certainly something that maybe is going on, conversations could be happening. You know, Fred and I are, you know, we're powerful, but we're, you know, <laughs> they don't tell us everything. Um, so they can find out more about that. Um, I think that's very interesting because similar to west of Third Avenue and Sunset Park, there are already people living there, actually, and it's not a completely meant, you know, it's, it's a mixed area, and people live there already. So I think it, it's changing, and people might be more open to the idea, and, and maybe the same here as well. Yeah, uh, Jack Pleschnik, uh, council member, Deutsche's office. Um, when looking for sites, what what does S, uh, SCA? Uh, what are their specifics as far as how far the site should be from other public schools, and where they would be located? Are there any specifics that we should be looking for when looking for lots? Sure, we can give you some basics. But keep in mind, everything is case by case, right? We, we would love to find sites that are at least, we say, smallest, 20,000 square feet. But larger, of course, is better. We don't build very high, right? Unlike condos and hotels, we don't build 25-foot school, 25-story schools. We build <laughs> five stories or so, little legs, only so much they can uh, climb. So we do need a larger um, lot. And that's what we say is the smallest. However, in Sunset Park, we're siting schools in much smaller lots because that's what's there. Um, when we're desperate, we do it. Um, so that's one thing. But you know, not every large site is appropriate. And so we have to carefully take a look at it. But that's something at least to start with. Right, a 20 by 100 foot lot is about the smallest um, we can look at. In terms of distance from other schools, if there's seat need, you know, the DOE will do things like school resumes. Um, that's not some, I mean, yes, we wouldn't do it on the very same block as another school probably, or one block away, but that's not so much a consideration. Um, schools loans can be divided in, in ways that, um, you know, are, are appropriate. So they can be close to other schools, that's okay. Um, as long as there's seat need in that sub-district, you know, we, we don't look at anything. We are <laughs> nothing if not willing to take a look at anything that might be available. So if your office knows of things or your constituents do, and I'm sure they do, the, you know, you're the ones that walk around the neighborhoods. As we said, um, we're very happy to take a look. Okay, thank you. Just as Tamar said, we'll look at anything, but, but one of the, in addition to the 20,000 square feet, in a perfect world, which it's not, curbside access, so that there's easy access. In other words, we don't want a building behind a building around the corner from a third, you know, if, if it's curbside, that makes for easy, um, it makes it easy to get the children in and the children out. So like the corner lots? Yeah, corner lots, yes. That's what we're looking for. Also more light and air, obviously, with corner lots and less, you know, being boxed in. Do we have any more questions? I was just going to ask if um, the schools that are presented in this presentation, are they um, a mix of public schools and charter schools, or is school construction authorities budget just for public schools? We, we just build public schools, but oftentimes this co-location in other words, we build it and the Department of Ed will decide what components go in there, but we just build public school buildings. 
um, or I, we we buy lease properties, renovate them for public schools. I have a, oftentimes, the buildings that we build are co-located with charters. I have a question. I was looking at the different school districts, and I noticed 17 was missing. Is there a reason? Or did I miss it? Maybe I missed it. 23 was missing also. No, it, right. Um, what we did in the beginning, because we were talking about capacity, was only talked about the districts that have seat need right now. Yeah. Um, it could be that in the next capital plan, those districts will have seat need. Right now, they don't. Um, and so what they get from the capital budget is a great many projects, but not new, brand new buildings. Okay, so 17 and 23, they don't have Correct. seat need. Yes. Are they part of the reconstruction effort? Are they getting the schools upgraded on yes. some level? Yes, 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 oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the capital investment is spread everywhere. Right. Every single school, every single district. I would like to get a list of what's being done in 17 and 23. Sure. Where is so, with Keisha, because I want to see. Well, in the capital plan, there's a section for District 17 and a section for District 23. So we, have a we probably have a copy in the office. Well, it's on our website. It. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, if you have a copy of that gigantic book, you just... No, because it looks yeah. great. Everything you're doing looks yeah. awesome. But it was glaring that I know that 17 was missing. No. I wasn't sure about 23. Yeah. And maybe well, still. quite a few weren't in yeah. because they specifically, and I apologize because I meant to say that, that what we'll look at now is uh, districts with seat need only. You That's the capacity. That. You did. But I just couldn't imagine that 17, I couldn't imagine anywhere in Brooklyn Not that's devoid of seat need. Yeah. It's just the well, actually, but I believe you. It, yeah, I believe you. Yeah, well, if you look at the utilization rates, uh, which you can find in the blue book, mm -hmm. you actually will see in those districts, oddly, um, a lot of the schools aren't filled. Okay. Yeah. The difference is, like, in District 17, you might have schools that are 80% utilized. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm just thinking of that PS 254 in District 22, 154% of capacity utilization. I so I it's. Yeah. She was clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do we have any other questions? Thanks, everybody. I okay. really appreciate your time. Well, we thank you for a wonderful presentation. That concludes our business um, with the school construction authority. Excuse me, no, this goes. Let me get out. <laughs> this goes on the podium. Right. But this way. Thank you. And we're going to go. DJ, would you do the final one for me, please? Thank you. Tonight's, tonight's sixth agenda item is a uh, presentation by the Center for Arts Education on Nonpartisan Voter Engagement in Arts Education. Representatives of the School Center for Arts Education are here tonight and will be available to take questions from the borough board members. Welcome Lisa Levy. Please come to, well, you're at the podium. And um, please state your name and title for the record. Hi, my name is Lisa Levy, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Engagement from the Center for Arts Education, and I promise I will be very quick, because I know everybody wants to go home, as do I. Um, so, but thank you so much for having me um, and allowing me to speak. So the reason that I'm here is because I wanted to just inform you of a few facts. So as you heard from the last speaker, that yes, there are 1.1 million students in New York City. It is the largest school district in the country. There are actually about 600 students in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is actually the, the, the most populated borough in the city right now. And there are 1,940 schools in the entire city, um, and so with with five with about 600 in Brooklyn, that's that's a lot of kids. Um, we have about 260,000 students just in Brooklyn alone. So what I'm going to talk about just very briefly is arts in the schools. Arts including visual arts, dance, theater, music. Now, I hope I don't have to convince you that arts is important. Music, we probably all listen to music at some point. We paint, we do all sorts of artistic things. But those things are not happening in a vacuum. We need to encourage that. We need to learn about that. And one of the most ideal places to do that is in our schools in classrooms, curricular arts. 
I mean, the fact is that unless we provide funding for arts in schools, we're not going to have teachers, we're not going to have resources, we're not going to have beautiful classrooms like we were just hearing about with our, from our, our last speakers. So one of the ideal ways to do that is by encouraging people to go vote and to hold our elected officials accountable. Because the fact is that they're the ones who are making many of these decisions. Just like all of you folks on community boards, we know that elected officials are the ones who are making the decisions. But the fact is, unfortunately, we have an extraordinarily low voter turnout in New York. 41 out of, out of all states. That's where we were last year in our presidential election in New York State. 41. That's abysmal. Um, and the and um, we were four, we had 14 percent voter turnout in the primary. Also abysmal. We need to do better, and we can do better. But we need to give people a reason to go to the polls. So what we're doing is we're handing out information, telling people that they can hold their elected officials accountable, and they can get stuff done by asking people, asking candidates about issues like, are you going to support arts in the schools? These are, these are bread and butter issues that people can talk about. So we have information about arts in the schools, which I can hand out to everyone. And we have information about what we are doing in all five boroughs. Um, one big issue is that when Mayor de Blasio was elected four years ago, he put $92 million into our schools, which was part of which was used to hire more than 300 arts teachers. Those are all good paying union jobs that are putting people to work and that are teaching our public school students. And that money expires after this academic year. So we should be asking everyone who's running including the mayoral candidates, are they going to support a renewal of that funding so that more teachers can be hired, so that more funding can be put toward arts education? Um, so just wanted to let you all know that we are here, Center for Arts Education. Um, if you'd like to ask me some questions, please feel free. I can provide my cards. I can provide this information. Thank you so much for this information. We have been around um, Brooklyn. We were at Atlantic Antic. Um, I've been speaking with lots of our partners. I was out in East New York at Arts East New York just last week. Um, we're working with St. Nick's Alliance. We're working with a lot of different organizations here in Brooklyn and all over New York City. We're in, in lots of schools throughout Brooklyn um, doing direct service, working with teachers, doing professional development. So. Just wanted to let you know. And I do live here in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn. So I'm a, obviously a big fan of Brooklyn. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that you know, this, is, this is something that I'm obviously a very big, very big supporter of, very passionate about. My parents were both New York City public school teachers. And so I, I want to make sure that every child has access to arts in the schools. So I hope that you will um, come and take a look at some of the materials that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Does anybody have any questions, actually? No? OK, well, I'll pass out this information. Thank you. Do any members of the board, I'm sorry, do any members of the board, board or the representative have any old business? I'm just showing him how to. Okay. I just want to make sure so we don't have any questions for the last presenter. All right. So stay a minute. Okay. So, do any members of the borough board have any old business or anything that they want to discuss? Any new business? Our next meeting will be on Wednesday, November 8th, 2017, at 6 p.m. May I have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? Shirley McRae, Chair of Community Board 2, so moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, Ms. Fuller, CB1, second on the motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 
All of those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. I want to thank you all for coming. See you next month. Be well.